This land's not my land. I'm from Rhode Island. But now Rhode Island is called Best My Land. And Tennessee now is Tennessee ground. This land was bought from you and me. As I was walking through Oklahoma, I saw it's now called Oklahoma Depot. And Idaho now is Idaho Homes. This land was made by Sarah Lee. And it gets worse now. Some NBA star has bought Wyoming. It's now Wyoming. So, so now I'm someone. Please buy New Jersey. We hear the naming rights are free. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we could go on and on with such names as New Spamshire. Pennzoildania. Texlax. And Massengill Disposable Chusets. But we just get a little sentimental when it comes to the selling of our great land. Oh, beautiful for spacious skybox seats atop Mount Hood. We can't address our budget mess, but corporations could. America, America. clip was a little extreme, but uh, it nevertheless makes an important message in a country of uh, growing debt and uh, shrinking revenues. Uh, it, it's actually my personal conviction that uh, in the same way that the internet is taking over reporting and a lot of revenue from the newspapers, so sponsorship represents a growing force in taking over from in-program advertising. Uh, our program is not yet called the Home Depot Iliad Summer Lecture Series, but maybe if they wrote a big enough check, who knows? <laughs> but uh, with that, it's uh, time for us to uh, thank our uh, far more uh, sensitive uh, sponsors uh, once again, um, our very good friends at uh, Kendall and Hanover, a uh, great consistent sponsor and an impressive operation in our community. Uh, secondly, uh, Wells Fargo Advisors, financial consultants and uh, trusted advisors to so many here in the Upper Valley. Uh, and finally, our newest sponsor, uh, Caldwell Law, experts in estate planning, a critical service that many of us need. I'd like to thank them all. I don't think I have to uh, put up uh, or dwell on the uh, list of reminders are all the rules here. Cause, uh, so I thought I'd just simply put up the slide. Uh, please uh, get your Q&A cards in, uh, particularly uh, after the second speaker. Uh, control your responses if you can. Uh, I don't think there's too much contentious today, but we'll see. Uh, DVDs are on sale for weeks two and three. Uh, and uh, finally, close down your cell phones, if you will, so it's not quite so irritating to other people. Uh, weren't our speakers wonderful last week? Um, I I've written to both uh, Tim and Matt on how impressed we were with uh, their presentations and uh, their content, in some cases quite frightening, uh, but also the facts and figures we've simply not seen before. Uh, 
Now, uh, we haven't completed uh, this, but we're, we're talking to Matt and his assistant to make sure that uh, those of you who've already requested uh, copies of those slides will get them. Uh, would you please, for the time being, uh, call the office and just make sure that they have your name when we uh, are finished uh, making those supplies available. Uh, this week, uh, as you can see, we're going to talk about corporations. Uh, corporations and uh, the law. Um, and the growing impact of uh, lobbying and money, uh, as well as the Supreme Court's uh, helpful hand in, uh, to the unregulated power of uh, corporate wealth. We have two experts here today. Um, one, uh, uh, first uh, a lawyer, uh, Gus Beth, will be talking about the awesome increases in money and influence from corporate America. And I guess by implication, uh, corporate Russia or corporate China or anybody else who's a foreign power and wants to have a voice in our elections. Uh, later on, uh, after the break, Judy Brown will download her very strong views about the increasing politicization of the previously lis uh, legalistic Supreme Court. Uh, some of you uh, might have heard uh, Gus speak. Oh, incidentally, you like our new slides? I came in here this morning and this mirror effect on polarization, the guys backstage had just made a change and I think they look great. So uh, I, I think this suggests that you're gonna see both sides of Gus this morning, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, some of you have heard uh, Gus speak before uh, particularly on uh, some of his personal passions on environmental issues. Uh, but today he represents another of his uh, growing concerns. And no, it's not the Civil War or what Gus might call the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, but the worrisome increase in corporate lobbying, money, and overall influence. With no further ado, but thanks to the Vermont Law School for uh, delivering uh, Gus to us today. I've told him already I'm not going to read his lengthy bio uh, because you guys have all read it anyway. Uh, and this man next to me is Gus Speth, and uh, yeah, you get him for the next 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Bruce, uh, for not reviewing my bio once again. I get tired of hearing it. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to participate in this distinguished forum, I must say, uh, and uh, congratulations to Iliad for a well-conceived uh, program, uh, and, and, uh, and thanks to all of you for coming out. I think you make me realize what uh, Iliad really uh, stands for. Uh, intelligent life exists around Dartmouth. <laughs> uh, well, you want the good news or the bad news? Uh, let me give you start with the uh, with the bad news. That usually works better. Um, if we uh, look at 30 key measures of national well-being, national progress across a 20-country sample of the advanced industrial democracies. What we find now, at the end of several decades of decline, is that the United States, our beloved country, is at the bottom, the dead bottom on most of these, or next to the bottom on the rest. 30 key measures uh, of national progress. Well, that's not just bad news, that's really bad news. Well, the, here's the good news. An attractive and very pleasant and successful America can, is still, still within our power to realize by mid-century. In this America, America the possible, I call it, uh, our country 
will have rejoined uh, the leading nations in realizing social justice and well-being, uh, in building peace and real global security, in sustaining our planet's environmental assets. We will have reclaimed our democracy from what was once properly called the moneyed interests. And we will have seen a deep transformation in our country's dominant uh, values and culture, leaving far behind uh, today's materialism and anthropocentrism and contempocentrism. And we will have realized a new American dream in everyday life, an America where the pursuit of happiness is sought not in more getting and spending, but in the growth of human solidarity, real democracy, and devotion to the public good, where the average American is empowered to achieve his or her human potential, and where the virtues of simple living and community self-reliance and good fellowship and respect for nature predominate. In this America the possible, we will also have avoided a rather long list of potential calamities looming on the horizon. Calamities like severe climate disruption that, if unaddressed, could become so overwhelming that the struggle to cope with them would monopolize the resources of time, energy, and money and effectively prevent us from realizing the wonderful future that can still be ours. Now, that's a very nice future, you might be thinking. But how in the world do we get there? Well, I want to begin this lecture by sketching how real change might come to America, how we might actually realize America the possible, and then I'll identify the transformative changes uh, that are needed in the corporate sector itself. Well, the journey to America the possible begins when enough Americans have come to three uh, conclusions. The first is that something is profoundly wrong with our overall system of political economy, the operating system on which our country now runs. That system is routinely generating terrible results. It's failing us as we see every day socially, economically, environmentally, politically. And when big problems emerge across the entire spectrum of national life, when we have encompassing problems that can't be due to small reasons, if we just implement this reform here and here, it's going to be all right, because it won't. We have encompassing problems because of fundamental flaws in our economy and in our political system. Well, the second conclusion follows from the first. It's the imperative of system change, of building a new political economy, a new operating system. Progressive causes in America today all confront the challenge of trying to make progress within a system of political economy that cares profoundly about profits and about growth and about power, but cares about society and the natural world, mainly when it's required by law to do so. So it's up to us as citizens to inject values of social justice and sustainability and peace into this system. And government is our primary vehicle for accomplishing this. And typically we attempt to do it by working within the system to promote needed reforms. But it seems to me it's now abundantly clear that these reformist approaches are not succeeding. And therefore, to deal successfully with all the challenges America now faces, we've got to complement reform and working within the system with at least equal efforts aimed at transformative change in the system itself to a new political economy, a new operating system that routinely delivers good results for people and planet. And the third conclusion is that contrary to what we are always told, an attractive and viable and plausible alternative to the current system does indeed exist. We certainly don't yet understand all the details of how this new alternative system will look, but we do know enough to have confidence that something much better can be built. We know enough to start building it. And in particular, we know that at the core of this new operating system, must be a new economic paradigm. 
And in this paradigm, the true priority of the economy, the true priority of economic life, is no longer to grow profit and product and power, but is rather to sustain people and place and planet. Well, I think these are the three foundational conclusions from which the work of system change can move forward. They are certainly not the conventional wisdom today, and more, but more and more people are coming to these conclusions. And from the vantage point that these three conclusions provide, we can see how the dynamics of system change might, might come into play. So consider these possibilities. As conditions in our country continue to decline across a wide front, or at best, fester as they are, ever larger number of Americans lose faith in the system and its ability to deliver on the values it proclaims. And the system steadily loses legitimacy, leading to a crisis of legitimacy. We don't have to predict that many people will begin looking for and demanding something better. It's already happening. Meanwhile, traditional crises, both in the economy and in the environment, grow more numerous and fearsome, and they further undermine the system and open the door to real change. Progressives of all stripes coalesce and find their voice and their strength. And together, they present a common vision of a new American dream. And they pioneer the development of a powerful set of new ideas and policy proposals confirming that the path to a better world does indeed exist. Meanwhile, people and groups plant the seeds of change through a host of alternative arrangements, principally at the local level. We see the proliferation already today of innovative models of local living economies, sustainable communities, transition towns, as well as innovative business models, including social enterprises and for-benefit and worker-owned businesses that prioritize community and environment over profit and growth. These initiatives provide inspirational models of how things might work in a new political economy that truly is devoted to sustaining human and natural communities. And they inspire a contagious proliferation. Demonstrations and protests multiply as more and more people join in the famous creed occur from the film Network, which most people here are old enough to remember. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. The protests swell to become a powerful national and international movement for transformation. And finally, Sensing the direction in which things are moving, the wiser and more responsible among our leaders rise to the occasion, support the growing movement for change, and frame a compelling story or narrative that draws on the best of the American tradition and points the way to the America that can be. And as a result, this movement for change broadens dramatically. Well, we certainly don't know how these and other forces will emerge and interact, but we do know this, that pleas for immediate amelioration on jobs, on tax justice, on climate action, will be met with proposals for modest accommodation and half measures, and that the struggle for deep systemic change will be met with a fierce opposition. And so an important overall conclusion emerges Namely, that the prospects for real change will depend mightily on the state of our democracy at the time and the power of the social and political movement that is built. It's simply unimaginable that American politics as we know it today will deliver the major changes needed. Even most of the proposals for modest reforms offered by progressives in Washington today will not be possible without a new politics in America. So political reform and building a new progressive movement in America must be priority number one. Above all else, we must build in America a new democratic reality, a government that is truly 
by, of, and for the people. Now, if this is the overall picture, how do corporations fit into it? I think they're in this picture in many, many ways, of course, but I wish to stress two. First, I spoke of the need to fundamentally redesign the economy. That means that the corporation must be fundamentally redesigned. And second, I indicated that pro-democracy political reform must be top priority. That means that corporate political power must be dramatically curtailed. So let me say a few general words about each of these propositions, and then we'll take up the specific changes that seem essential. Corporations, as we know, are the principal actors on capitalism's stage. If capitalism is a growth machine, as leading economists have labeled it, it's corporations that are doing most of the growing. And if growth is destroying the environment, it's corporations that are doing most of the destroying. In the United States, uh, growth and capitalism have few critics, but corporations, by contrast, are fair game. They've been in the crosshairs of social critics for generations, and for good reason. Like Caesar, today's corporations bestride the narrow world like a colossus. In 1970, there were 7,000 multinationals. By 2007, there were at least 65,000, together contributing about a quarter of gross world product. And of the 100 largest economic entities in the world, 53 are corporations, not countries. And the United States is still the capital of the corporate world. A third, or 100, of the world's 300 largest companies are U.S. corporations. And corporations today count for about 85 percent of U.S. business revenue. Of course, corporations do do a lot of good in the world. Uh, they made my DVR, built the hybrid cars and photovoltaic energy systems I've purchased, uh, keep me more or less informed, do my banking, make my blood pressure medication. I'm grateful for all of these and much more. And there is, in fact, a lot of genuine corporate greening going on in the world today. But still, in a world where both the environment and society are in such deep trouble, and where corporations are such a dominant force, something major must be done. I mentioned earlier that if we were going to redesign and build a new sustaining economy, we're going to have to build a new politics to get there. And we're not going to see a new, truly democratic politics until we dramatically reform the role of corporations in our politics. Well, the conventional diagnosis is that our national politics and the governance that it yields are now dysfunctional, with Washington beset by polarization and gridlock. And it's indeed true that Washington Day is failing our country across a wide front. And this failure is a source of a lot of justifiable frustration and even anger in our country. But I would submit that our national political condition is actually much more dire than this diagnosis uh, suggests. Uh, if one reviews the last uh, several decades, the results actually indicate that Washington has been highly successful uh, and even efficient in serving certain interests and objectives. Orchestrating, for example, a vast transfer of national income to the very rich. And we've, so we ought to face the ironic truth of the statement that Reagan made that we often disagree with, but it has this germ of truth in it when you think about it. He said, government's not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And indeed, in recent years, government has been the problem, uh, at least a big part of it. But the answer is not to write off government. The answer is to change it. So relatedly, the complaint that our major political parties are polarized in a way not seen since Reconstruction, while valid, 
has a, a plague on both your houses uh, ring to it. Uh, and in fact, though, uh, leading political scientists uh, pointed out long before the Tea Party phenomenon that it has been one party doing most of the polarizing, uh, veering sharply to the right and pulling the country along behind. So the story of America's political decline has been told well and often enough. And part of that story is the way in which political decline has moved in parallel with the rise of economic inequality and the influence of money in our politics. What we've seen is the emergence of a vicious cycle. Growing income disparities shift power to the rich, and that shift in turn reduces the prospect of our de democracy doing something about the growing disparities. If plutocracy exists, when the wealthy have a greatly disproportionate influence in government, and if corporatocracy is a political state where large corporations have massive power in government, America is now teetering on the verge of full-blown plutocracy and corporatocracy in substance, if not in form. Everyone knows that there's a tug of war between corporate power and citizen power. And in the day-to-day -day world, it's hardly an even match. We all know that corporations exert great power in the political process through both lobbying and campaign contributions. Corporate political action committee, corporate political action committee spending increased almost 15-fold over the past three decades. And now, with, with the emergence of the super PACs uh, and the so-called independent campaign spending, just one super PAC, one of many, is slated to spend $400 million uh, in this election of 2012. In 1968, there were fewer than 1,000 registered lobbyists in Washington. Today, there are well over 10,000. And of the 100 largest lobbying efforts in Washington, 92 are corporations or their trade associations. The Chamber of Commerce is the largest. Remember that corporations spend a lot more money on lobbying than they do on campaign contributions. Yet the very difficulty of political reform underscores the need for it. As Michael Waldman, the director of one of the better groups, best groups, the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU has said, progressives have to grapple with this central truth. We can't solve the country's problems if we don't fix the systems of democracy. So nothing is more important in America today than building a new politics through a unified pro-democracy movement aimed at real citizen sovereignty. The antidote to creeping to corporatocracy and plutocracy in America is a strong, muscular democracy in America. So these are our two big questions. How do we redesign the corporation to fit this new economic paradigm? And how do we replace corporate power with citizen power in our politics? Big questions indeed. And redesign. Our goal ought to be to redesign this 19th century model of the corporation so that it fits the 21st century. So um, what do we actually do? I like to think of the redesign challenge in three stages or three levels, each representing deeper changes. But implicit in these three stages is a pincer approach, if you will, to corporate change, a top-down strategy to rein in the giant corporations, and a bottom-up strategy of building a new world of innovative public purpose, locally rooted corporate entities that can grow to perhaps become the norm or close to it. So here's some stage one changes. Get the prices right. Design and implement by law and regulation measures that require the full internalization of social and environmental costs. Eliminate outdated subsidies and loopholes that lead to further distortion of prices. Put a stiff price on carbon and other greenhouse gases. Insist on strong environmental and consumer and labor and other social protections 
in trade agreements, revive and enforce antitrust law, tilt the playing field back towards labor's right to organize and bargain collectively, periodically review and, when appropriate, revoke corporate charters. Most corporate law statutes uh, contain provisions allowing states to revoke charters if the corporation has grossly violated the public interest. Making this threat alive and real could have very salutary effects. Exclude or expel unwanted corporations. The United States, for example, and, and other instances around the world, uh, campaigns have been launched to block uh, the siting and location of uh, certain uh, realist, uh, really, um, like Walmart and other giant realtors uh, to keep them out of various locations. Roll back limited liability. Uh, corporate directors and top managers should be personally liable for gross negligence and other major failings, and personal liability could extend to shareholders in certain cases. And change the financial incentives uh, facing corporations and their executives so that they actually reward long-termism and punish short-termism. There are ways to do all of these things, of course. Um, well, that's just a start, right? Um, now, let's move to the deeper uh, stage two changes. Um, and I want to call your attention here to the work of the TELUS Institute in Boston and its corporate Corporation 2020 initiative. They believe that corporate design is the missing business and public policy issue of our time. And they have identified several new principles of corporate design, which I will share with you. Principle one, the purpose of the corporation is to harness private interest to serve the public interest. And under this principle, the corporation can be launched in private interest, but when those interests conflict with the public interest, the public good will come good first and will uh, prevail. Principle two, Corporations shall accrue fair returns for shareholders, but not at the expense of the legitimate interest of other stakeholders. And here, the shareholder gains will not be achieved by shifting costs of production onto, onto other stakeholders, such as employees and communities and the general public and future generations. Principle three. Corporations shall distribute their wealth equitably among those who contribute to wealth creation. Of course, today, profits are viewed as accruing to the owners, investors, but with an equitable distribution of earnings, the one envisioned here, profits will be shared among employees, the community, and others that directly or indirectly contribute to wealth generation, including society in general. Principle four. Corporations shall be governed in a manner that is participatory, transparent, ethical, and accountable. Well, this requires that there be meaningful engagement of all stakeholders in the leadership and management of the corporation, including membership on corporate boards. Perhaps you know that in Germany and Sweden, two successful manufacturing and industrial countries, employees now select from a third to a half of the board members of the large corporations. Principle five, this is one I love. Corporations shall not infringe on the right of natural persons to govern themselves, nor infringe on other universal human rights. Here, corporations will accept the proposition that government is accountable to the people and will embrace the separation of corporation and state. They will thus support strict regulation of lobbying and campaign finance and the protection of human rights at home and abroad. Well, it's not hard to design policies to implement these five principles. The important thing and the difficult thing, of course, is to agree on the principles. Uh, one such policy, for example, is the chartering of large corporations at the national and even international levels. Uh, the issuing of corporate charters today by the states is, as you know, lax and easily done. An advocacy group uh, in Virginia, a well-known tobacco state, 
uh, proposed incorporation of a new business uh, named License to Kill Incorporated. And their uh, business objective is stated to be marketing tobacco products in a way that would kill 400,000 Americans annually. And it sailed through the uh, incorporation process uh, unscathed in Virginia. Um, Lord knows they might, might have been given a pat on the back if they had tried it in Delaware. Um, proposals to revive the chartering process as a means of public control have been urged repeatedly in our history. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt did it. Uh, for national charters proposed for the trusts of his day. Between 1915 and 1932, at least eight bills were introduced into the Congress proposing federal chartering of large corporations. Well, they could, this federal chartering could apply to all large companies, uh, uh, or it fo could focus on certain sectors of the economy of, of high public interest, like the defense industry and banking and finance, uh, and national auditing and bond rating firms, uh, and industries that rely principally on uh, natural resources of the commons, such as water and energy and broadcasting. Uh, typical charter mandates in these federal charters could include requirements for the Board of Directors to approve all campaign finance and lobbying expenditures, broad stakeholder participation on corporate boards, enhanced shareholder rights, uh, as well as a general requirement to serve the public interest. Charters would have provisions requiring periodic review uh, in the public interest and the public would have a right to participate and charters could be revoked. Now stage three. Uh, it is the most transformative and stage three involves uh, two important concepts. The first is economic democracy. Uh, economic democracy where workers and consumers and the public, we citizens, have a large measure of control over corporate investment decisions, either through the political process uh, or because of an ownership interest in the enterprise. Well, the second key aspect of stage three is the building of a new type of corporate sector from the ground up, usually smaller companies locally rooted with a strong social mission as part of its DNA. So here we're talking about public-private hybrids, profit-not-for-profit hybrids, social enterprises, and other mission control companies. Well, needless to say, uh, some features of stage three are actually well underway uh, across America. The B Corporation program, where B stands for social benefit, includes a certification scheme for companies that meet high environmental and social and public accountability standards. As of 2011, there were over 400 certified B corporations with about two billion in annual revenues. And Maryland and Vermont and New Jersey and Virginia had adopted incorporation legislation modeled on the B corporation uh, principles. The Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, or BALI, convenes over 80 community networks in the United States and Canada representing more than 22,000 independent business members. And Bali's mission is to build and strengthen locally owned independent businesses that function in harmony with the community and local ecosystems and support social justice and democracy. Another dimension of, the, of this stage three uh, in, is one that's been stressed by the Democracy Collaborative at the University of Maryland, they point to the continued growth of community development corporations. There are apparently already 4,500 such not-for-profit corporations providing community services like housing, and there are almost 500 U.S. community development financial institutions that are serving markets not well served by conventional private finance. Marjorie Kelly, a good friend, has a new book out called Owning Our Future, and in it she explores several innovative ways for new corporations to achieve key social and environmental objectives. She points out that it's possible to blend 
the, the a central social mission of the company with profitable operations. And she points to three different models uh, for doing this. One are the stakeholder-owned companies uh, which put the ownership in the hands of non-financial stakeholders. Think co-ops. Uh, second uh, is mission-controlled companies which separate ownership and profits uh, from control and organizational direction. Think New York Times. Uh, third, uh, public-private hybrids, uh, where profit-driven and mission-driven design elements are combined in unique structures. Think of companies that are launched for profit by nonprofit entities, whether they're foundations or, or uh, NGOs. So, in sum, there is no shortage of good ideas about how to redesign the corporation, both from the ground up and to rein in uh, the giant corporations. So let's turn now to the pro-democracy political forms that reforms that might make such redesigns plausible. The most important pro-democracy reform, of course, is to undermine the power of money in our elections and in lobbying. Consider this news report uh, from the future, Dateline 2020. A funny thing happened on the way to plutocracy. Just when it seemed that big money donors were on, a verge, on the verge of a final takeover of American politics and that post-Watergate efforts to reform were dying a death of a thousand cuts, including a series of major ones inflicted by the Supreme Court, pro-democracy advocates changed tack, found a new way forward, and saved American elections. The key to their success was to shift emphasis of campaign finance reform to an ingenious combination of small donor contributions and public funding of elections, nothing less than the democratization of campaign finance itself. As a major report urged way back in 2010, uh, instead of focusing on attempts to further restrict the wealthy few, the new approach seeks to focus on activating the many. And this new approach had its first big success in the 2016 presidential race and led to the widely admired system that we take for granted today. Fanciful? Maybe not. The Fair Elections Now Act was introduced into Congress in 2011 to, uh, to regulate uh, the, uh, the funding of creating this type of, of private and public funding of congressional elections. A sister bill has been introduced to deal with presidential elections. They have a lot of supporters in both the House and the Senate, but I'm afraid almost all of them are Democrats. And several states have pursued uh, fair elections uh, laws uh, with good results. So all of us have a huge success uh, in this new approach. You know, consider the alternative, really. Our current campaign finance system is actually the worst in the Western world. Uh, so, meanwhile, major efforts have got to be pursued to address the many problems created by a string of Supreme Court decisions, of which uh, Citizens United is the most famous, or infamous, the floodgates are now open to unrestricted campaign spending by corporations and unions and well-to-do individuals. Amending the Constitution is what's needed. Glad to see move to amend and others gaining in strength and support. And in the process, we need to deprive corporations of constitutional personhood. But in the meanwhile, Congress should require disclosure of the sources of all campaign spending that's been tried twice, and both times it was defeated by Republican filibusters. There are other attractive ideas for regulation. Uh, one would require that corporate boards, or even the shareholders themselves, approve all campaign spending from the corporate treasury. A second regulation would truly enforce the requirement that corporate contributions be independent. That is not coordinated or linked in any way with the candidate that might be supported. And of course, the court could simply reverse itself 
uh, if a new justice replacing one of the five in the majority were appointed. Candidate access to the media should be enhanced and the power of money reduced by ensuring that all media carriers and service providers offer full access to political speech at rates offered to the most favored commercial customers and by requiring that broadcasters provide candidates with a minimum of free airtime as a condition of receiving their federal licenses. But of course, reforms uh, can't stop with the electoral process. Elections occur, and then there's the morning after. Much needs to be done to tighten the regulation of lobbying. There should be a ban on registered lobbyists engaging in campaign fundraising. No contributions to campaigns from lobbyists, no lobbyist bundling of multiple contributions, and no other form of lobbyist fundraising for federal candidates. Connecticut has enacted such a pay-to-play ban in 2005. It's been upheld by the courts. Congressional staff should be further professionalized and enlarged so that information and analysis from lobbyists is less important. Institutions like the Congressional Research Service should similarly be strengthened. Appropriate restrictions should be placed on large government contractors. The revolving door should be slammed shut. And, uh, and other changes should be made to regulate uh, lobbying uh, so that uh, these folks don't so dominate the process in Washington. So when one considers all the ways in which our politics begs for change and reform, it's really easy to see why so little that's what is essential of what is essential gets accomplished. A pro-democracy agenda like the one just described has got to move to top priority and it's got to draw support from Americans across the political spectrum. And so we've now arrived at the last question how do we begin to drive real change in our politics? And the short answer is that we need to build a powerful pro-democracy political movement in our country. None of the measures uh, that we so badly need are likely to get very far without such a powerful popular movement. And it's one that may gather real force as a result of what we're now seeing in this 2012 election. And after November, progressives of all stripes and many others need to come together as never before to drive this agenda. Successful movements for serious change are launched in protest against key features of the established order. And there is much to protest today in our politics. And real movements insist on real change. And here, one is reminded of Frederick Douglass's famous 1857 statement about in challenging slavery. He said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be moral, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. If we hope to succeed, then our movement has got to capture this spirit of Frederick Douglass, and I, uh, for one, am predicting that when this 2012 election is finally over, we will find huge numbers of Americans so fed up that they have indeed captured the spirit of Frederick Douglass. I thank you. But there wasn't really a comprehensive critique 
of the uh, of liberal jurisprudence. There wasn't sort of a center of gravity to really move the court to the right until the Reagan administration, until uh, Ronald Reagan came to Washington and Edmund Meese uh, became the attorney general and a group of uh, very intelligent uh, conservative lawyers came to Washington with them and decided that they weren't going to just sort of criticize one decision or another, they were going to sort of create a new agenda, a conservative agenda. And, and so what was it? Expand executive power, end racial preferences intended to assist African Americans, speed up execution, welcome religion into the public sphere, and above all, reverse Roe versus Wade and allow states to ban abortion. And 1981 uh, was also the time um, that the Federalist Society was founded. Now, a lot of people talk, you know, the Federalist Society was a group, you know, of conservative lawyers got together. A lot of people, for example, you know, Nan Aaron, talk about the Federalist Society as if it's like something out of the Da Vinci Code, that it's like really this scary, right? I mean, no, it's, the, 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 you know, the, the, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not a secret organization. It's just an organization of conservative lawyers. And in fact, liberals belatedly have recognized that there should be a counterpoint, and there is. There's the American Constitution Society, and it's thriving, and it's a very, uh, uh, you know, big and growing organization. And, and, but, but I think, you know, what, what's important to remember about the 80s is that it was a time of great conservative ferment and uh, energy. And I think this is something about what Obama was talking about when he got into trouble, talking about, you know, where, where you know, Ronald Reagan galvanized uh, a lot of people to think differently. Uh, about issues and you know who were of course two of the brightest lights uh, who came to Washington the young lawyers uh, who came to Washington to be conservatives and, and advance the agenda they were of course John Roberts and uh, Samuel Alito and you know there's no mystery I mean as, as the Alliance you know has never tires of pointing out there's no mystery of, of where they come from uh, and, and what they believe. I mean, you, you remember, in these, these came out during confirmation hearings. Um, you know, Samuel Alito in 1985 in the Solicitor General's office, you know, he wrote, what can be made of this opportunity to advance the goal of bringing about the eventual overruling of Roe versus Wade? Uh, later that year, applying for a promotion in the Justice Department, he wrote, I am particularly proud of my contributions to recent cases in which the government uh, has argued in the Supreme Court that the Constitution does not protect the right to an abortion. I mean, is there any doubt about where he stands on these issues? I mean, this is not, this is not a mystery, and it's not a mystery about Roberts either. But the, the, the conservative right through the Reagan years was more conservative than the Nixon years, but it was not what it became. And if you look at Ronald Reagan's appointments to the Supreme Court, um, the, um, the, the fact that the party was moving right, but not yet as far as it, right as it became, uh, is very much reflected. And, um, you know, Ronald Reagan in the 1980 election made a campaign promise that Jimmy Carter didn't even make. Reagan said, I am going to appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. I promise. So when Potter Stewart unexpectedly announced his resignation early in 1981, right after Reagan was inaugurated, uh, Reagan said to his people, find me a woman. Find me a woman. And they had to look pretty hard. There, weren't, there wasn't a deep bench of Republican women uh, qualified to be on the Supreme Court. And so they couldn't even go to the highest court in Arizona. They went to the Intermediate Appeals Court in Arizona and found Sandra Day O'Connor. And you know that was, uh, that was Reagan's agenda, more than overruling Roe v. Wade, although in theory he was against Roe. I mean, he, he had other, uh, other ideas about what the party um, should do. Now, in 1986, when, uh, when um, uh, Berger stepped down, uh, he promoted Rehnquist and named Ant uh, Antonin Scalia to the court. You know, very conservative justices. But the, and the key moment, really, in fact, a key moment in the history of our country, I think, came the next year, 1987, when Lewis Powell resigned. Lewis Powell had really been the key to the court. I mean, he was a slightly overworked term by a journalist, uh, the swing vote. But he really was the swing vote on affirmative action, on abortion, uh, on death penalty cases. And uh, he quit. 
and Ronald Reagan named Robert Bork to replace him. And for really the only time in my lifetime, the country really had a national conversation about what the Constitution meant, because Bork really, um, you know, couldn't run away, or he had such an extensive record. You know, he didn't believe in, uh, that the Constitution protected a right to privacy. And uh, he said, you know, the Civil Rights Act, was, was, had, he had said it was a monstrous thing. And, and the Senate, which was then in Democratic hands, they voted him down. They said, you know, too conservative. I mean, that's really what that vote was. That's all it was. I mean, the boat, it, was, it was no allegation of corruption or anything, but Bork was simply too conservative um, for the center of American politics in 1987. And that seat ultimately went to Anthony Kennedy. And the reason Anthony Kennedy was appointed, and the reason he was confirmed, is that he was more moderate than Bork than Bork was. So when people say Kennedy's some huge surprise that he's turned out to be not as conservative as Scalia or, or, or Rehnquist, that's not true because he was appointed to be, knowing that he was a more moderate justice. And again, that's a reflection of the politics of the time. And once, once Powell left, it was really O'Connor. Who, who, who took over the court. And from 1987 to 2005 when she left, um, the, the, the Rehnquist court was in many respects really, really the O'Connor court. But now let's uh, turn to our uh, second speaker, uh, Judy Brown. And you're going to see the two sides of Judy Brown as well. Uh, one of Iliad's most outstanding instructors, uh, group leaders. Uh, one of her students uh, told me a few months ago that he would be shocked if we did this series without Judy, a constitutional scholar, although she's a bit embarrassed uh, when I introduce her this way as a constitutional scholar. Uh, I think you will recognize uh, almost immediately why she is held in such high esteem by her students. A warm welcome for Judy Brown, please. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, your water and other water. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk to you today about a court that is in love with a fantasy of the American past. So let's take a brief constitutional excursion back in time. The year is 1905. The New York legislature has passed a law limiting the number of hours that bakers could work to 10 hours a day, 60 hours a week. The United States Supreme Court, in a case called Lochner versus New York, held that New York statute unconstitutional because it interfered with the freedom of each individual to bargain with his employer to make the best deal that he could. The court said this right, this freedom of contract, which by the way is mentioned nowhere in the Constitution, was implied from the limits, I have to read this, was implied from the limits the Constitution implies on the government's regulatory power. This right was so constitutionally compelling that it overrides the, the natural presumption that statutes, when they are passed, are presumed to be valid. Let me say that in English. The court refused to defer to the judgment of the New York legislature that the New York law on maximum hours was a good thing to do. In Lochner, the court said it was protecting the right of the individual employee. Nonsense. It was constitutionalizing the right of business to be completely free from any governmental regulation. Traditional legal scholarship has always criticized Lochner as constitutionalizing a particular economic theory, Spencerian economics, laissez-faire economics. 
One of my heroes, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, wrote famously in dissent, this case is decided upon an economic theory which a large part of the country does not entertain. The 14th Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. A constitution is not intended to embody a particular economic theory. Five of the nine justices of the Roberts Court are trying their hardest to return America to this laissez-faire economic regime. Until the middle of the 1930s, Lochner and his progeny dominated judicial thinking. Lochner was ultimately abandoned for several reasons. The first was internal inconsistencies. States could, said the court, legitimately regulate the hours and working conditions of certain employees, those who worked in dangerous jobs like miners, and those who were helpless and needed special protection, like women. Now I get to tell you one of my favorite constitutional stories. The theory about women was that working long hours was a threat to women's health, and that any threat to her health imperiled society because it imperiled her ability to bear and raise healthy children. That theory was upheld in 1914 in a case called Muller versus Oregon, for which case Louis Brandeis invented what we now call a Brandeis brief. He documented how the miserable working conditions which many women faced were in fact dangerous. To their health. Oregon had passed a law limiting the, no the number of hours that women could work in certain occupations, including laundries. Groups in favor of reforming the workplace looked for a famous lawyer to go to the Supreme Court to defend the Oregon law. And the first guy they approached was a fellow named Joseph Choate, who was then the head of the American Bar Association. Mr. Choate refused to take the case, saying, and I quote, I do not see why a big, husky Irish woman shouldn't work more than 10 hours a day if she so decides. <laughs> they then found Louis Brandeis, a Boston corporate lawyer who took the case, and the rest is history. Back to the demise of Lochner. In addition to these in internal inconsistencies, you couldn't regulate bakers, but you could regulate women and minors, the Holmes dissent was wisely, widely praised in academic and judicial circles, and many, many more people began to criticize social Darwinism. Most important, the Depression happened, and the economic reality of the Depression undermined the idea that reliance on the purportedly neutral, invisible hand of the market was the best way to preserve individual rights. But as I said, Lochnerian ideals seem to be emerging triumphant once again. The Roberts Court has been dismantling laws that restrict corporate freedom, often doing so under the guise of protecting the First Amendment or protecting state sovereignty. I want to talk about two current examples of this disturbing trend, campaign finance and health care. Campaign finance first. Any discussion of campaign finance must begin with this preliminary question. Is a corporation a person? You might be surprised by my answer, yes and no. Good lawyer answer. <laughs> Corporate personhood is an artificial, semantic construct, what lawyers call a legal fiction. It was developed in the late 19th century in order to give non-human business entities standing to bring claims under the newly enacted 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment talks about persons. So the real issue is not whether a corporation is a person, but rather which constitutional protections 
that humans have should also be extended to corporations. Dissenting in a 1975 case, no less a staunch conservative than the late Chief Justice Rehnquist said, and I quote, extension of First Amendment protections to corporation based on individual freedom of con conscience strains the rationale of the 14th Amendment beyond the breaking point. To ascribe to such artificial entities an intellect or a mind is to confuse metaphor with reality. <laughs> Pretty strong stuff. Nonetheless, a majority of the justices on the current court have disagreed, describing corporate political spending as at the very heart of the First Amendment. I thought that was political speech, but I guess I'm wrong. Rehnquist's trenchant observations have been totally ignored by the Roberts Court. The Roberts Court has given corporate entities full speech rights not only in connection with public affairs, but also when it comes to selling their products. Corporate or commercial speech originally received no, zero, none First Amendment protection. In 1976, it was given some protection, but less than that given to political speech, which, as I said, is truly at the heart of the First Amendment. Today, commercial speech is treated on a par with political speech, so that businesses selling their products now have as much protection as those engaging in political debate. Ask yourselves whether these protections are really about free speech or whether they are about a judicial deregulatory or Lochnerian agenda to insulate corporate America from any government regulation. Back to campaign finance. Proponents of campaign finance reform frame the question this way. Why is money speech? Why is the unequal access that, can, that money can buy a First Amendment issue at all? And even if it is, why can't the government regulate or restrict that speech in order to enhance the quality of political debate? Why can't the government keep corruption out of the political process by leveling the playing field? The answer after Citizens United and echoes Lochner, freedom means no government regulation at all. The first campaign finance law was passed in 1907. Called the Tillman Act, it barred corporate political contributions to national campaigns. In the modern era, the story of campaign finance starts in 1976 in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. Buckley involved a law Congress passed after Watergate, remember Watergate, to regulate campaign contributions. Buckley held that spending money in political campaigns is political speech and therefore gets the highest level First Amendment protection. The Supreme Court muddied the waters a little bit. They said that the First Amendment allowed limitations on contributions but not expenditures, a somewhat esoteric distinction that troubled generations of law students and law professors. The theory, and again I have to read it because it never made any sense to me, the theory was something like this. Contribution limits were okay because they created the appearance of corruption and the First Amendment allowed the government to regulate in order to avoid corruption or the appearance of corruption. Limits on expenditures, on the other hand, were unconstitutional because since money is speech, those limits substantially restrained speech. And limits on expenditures had less of an appearance of corruption than limits on contributions. 
We don't have to worry about that anymore because Citizens United held that all limits, whether on contributions or expenditures, are unconstitutional. Between Buckley <coughs> and Citizens United, there were more confusing developments. All I can say is the cases were not only confusing, they were inconsistent and unpredictable. All that seemed clear was that regulation was okay if it was for the purpose of avoiding corruption or the appearance of corruption. But nothing ever seemed to satisfy that test. Despite voluminous evidence of corruption, the court never said that it was enough. Then came Citizens United. Citizens United was argued twice. The first time it reached the Supreme Court, the question was narrow and technical. Did existing campaign finance laws cover movies, particularly an anti-Clinton film called Hillary the Movie? <laughs> After the argument, Chief Justice Roberts ordered the lawyers to broaden the case to cover the constitutionality of all campaign finance laws, and he set a special early opening for the court the following fall to hear it. This from the man who said at his confirmation hearings that he believed in judicial modesty and who likened the judicial role to an umpire calling balls and strikes. But now it was clear he had the votes. As Justice Stevens said, dissenting in Citizens United, after reaching down to create a constitutional issue it did not have to hear, the court overruled, reinterpreted, and disavowed precedent to reach the political result that it wanted. There is a widely accepted doctrine called constitutional avoidance. These are some of the phrases that the Federalist Society that Jeff Tubin talked about love to use. Constitutional avoidance is a doctrine loudly praised by those on the right and the left who condemn judicial activism, whatever that is. Constitutional avoidance means deciding cases on the narrowest possible grounds and not reaching the constitutional question unless it is absolutely necessary. There's another doctrine, judicial self-restraint, also widely promoted by the anti-judicial activism crowd. Judicial self-restraint says that judges should defer to the legislature except in extraordinary circumstances. And there is a doctrine known as stare decisis, or respect for precedent. Citizens United ignored all of these principles. Responding to accusations of judicial activism in a special concurring opinion in Citizens United, Justices Roberts and Alito denied they were ignoring precedent, judicial self-restraint, and legislative findings because the Constitution made us do it. I quote, judges have to have the humility to recognize that they operate within a system of precedent. But when fidelity to any particular precedent does more to damage a constitutional ideal than to advance it, we must be more willing to depart from precedent. The dog ate my homework. <laughs> Citizens United held two things. First, no limits on contributions or expenditures by unions, individuals, corporations are constitutional. Second, the appearance of corruption is no longer a valid justification for regulating campaign finance. Justice Kennedy, independent expenditures, including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. The appearance of influence or access will not show corruption and will not cause the electorate to lose face in our democracy. 
Has he looked out the window lately? <laughs> the court did leave in place one permissible regulatory rationale. This is some of the stuff that Gus talked about. That corporations and unions could be required to disclose information about contribution, arguing that disclosure would protect democracy from hidden corporate agendas. Prompt disclosure can provide shareholders and citizens with information needed to hold corporations and elected officials liable. I guess the theory is, if we don't like what a corporate board does, we can vote them out at the next annual meeting. Sure. Congress, of course, has refused twice to pass a law requiring disclosure, and Justice Thomas noted in Citizens United that in his view, any requirement of disclosure would be unconstitutional. Let's think a little bit more about disclosure. Many of us own stock in corporations, either directly or through mutual funds. Even if corporations disclose the specific ideal, the specific details, sorry, of their campaign contributions, which they do not, how can we as shareholders determine whether a given company's specific contribution to a specific politician or issue is in our best interest? Moreover, Huge amounts of money are given to secret 501c4 entities, which do not have to disclose anything. Citizens United is outrageous, not only for what it holds, but also for how the court reached its decision. I will resist the temptation to blather on about Justice Scalia's silly statement that Thomas Jefferson intended this result when he wrote the First Amendment in 1790. <laughs> the court boldly and audaciously created a major constitutional issue when it did not have to and chose a particularly bad case in which to do it. Since the lower courts had only decided the narrow issue whether McCain-Feingold covered movies, there was no record of facts before the Supreme Court. So the entire case is little more than an abstract essay about free speech without any guidance from the legislature or the lower court. Remember those balls and strikes? Here, there were no pitches at all. <laughs> Citizens United displays a really scary judicial eagerness to overturn settled precedents to serve an ideological agenda. I would argue that this in itself is a form of corruption, a corruption of the judicial process, which undercuts the integrity of the Supreme Court. Americans have lost faith in the political process, despite Justice Kennedy's highest platitudes and are now, according to recent polls, losing faith in the court's political neutrality. Before we leave campaign finance, we need to examine two other devastating post-Citizens United developments, one in Arizona and one in Montana. Montana first. Ninety-nine years ago, after years of incredibly corrupt electoral practices, Montana passed a law banning the use of corporate money to support or oppose candidates. That statute was almost identical to the part of McCain-Feingold struck down in Citizens United. The Montana Supreme Court upheld its law, arguing that Montana had such a wild and woolly history of copper companies regularly buying and selling judges and senators that they were justified in not following Citizens United. But the lawyer who brought Citizens United immediately asked the United States Supreme Court to stay the Montana ruling and reverse it summarily. Summary reversal means don't even take the case. Don't listen to the lawyers. Don't read the briefs. Don't read the evidence of corruptions. Just get rid of it. 
in the opinion arguing whether they should do that or not, Justices Ginsburg and Breyer urged the court to take the case, saying what had happened since Citizens United made it extremely difficult to, stay, to say with a straight face that corporate campaign contributions did not constitute corruption. But a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case and summarily reversed the Montana Supreme Court. In other words, they refused to listen to any evidence at all about corruption. Politics is now awash in secret money, but the United States Supreme Court refuses to pay any attention to that alarming fact. Is it any wonder that people are cynical about the court? Arizona's even worse. Arizona's worse for a lot of reasons. I live there in the winter. <laughs> and you should see what this Arizona court did about abortion yesterday, but that's another story. About a year ago, the United States Supreme Court struck down Arizona's voluntary public finance system, which had been adopted in a referendum in response to years and years of political corruptions and scandals. As an incentive, it's a little complicated, so bear with me. As an incentive to accept public financing without fear of being outspent by privately financed wealthy candidates, the Arizona law gave publicly financed candidates an extra dollar for every dollar the privately financed candidate spent above a certain cap. Chief Justice Roberts said this scheme was unconstitutional because it burdened the speech of the wealthy candidates because they might spend less if they knew that the publicly financed candidate would get some extra dollars. And since spending is speaking, remember that money is speech, this possibility violated the First Amendment. Wow. Justice Kagan vigorously disagreed. She said that the Arizona system really allowed more speech, more ideas in the marketplace of ideas. To this, the Chief Justice replied, the purpose of the First Amendment is not to level the playing field. This is Lochner run amok. Arizona only indirectly singled out the wealthy, but even that was too much for Roberts. Self-financed candidates may shut down parts of their campaigns to avoid additional dollars for publicly financed candidates, and this may possibly violate the First Amendment. Some folks have more money than others but the Constitution will not let the government do anything about economic inequality, despite James Madison's famous remarks in the Federalist Papers that the purpose of the Constitution is to protect minority interests from the tyranny of the majority. Instead, said Chief Justice Roberts, the government must remain neutral. Again, according to Roberts, Justice Kagan is therefore wrong when she says that free speech in a democracy means ensuring a fair electoral process. Wow, again. This takes us back to the laissez-faire world of Lochner, a world where the Constitution does not permit any regulation of business at all, no matter how predatory or unfair the corporate conduct. There are two core constitutional principles at war here. Absolute individual freedom, pure libertarianism, and equality. The campaign finance cases ignore one while enshrining the other. Protecting the powerful while denying that that will make us lose faith in democracy insults our intelligence. Protecting the powerful from any regulation does not enhance free speech. It suppresses the speech of the powerless and prevents minorities from the opportunity of becoming the new majority. Ready for health care? 
The health care opinion was the most widely anticipated ruling of this term. Congress in 2010 passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act in order to, I'm reading from the legislation, increase the number of Americans covered by health insurance and decrease the cost of health care. Among hundreds, we can debate about whether the statute actually accomplished those goals, but that's not relevant to what the Supreme Court did. Among hundreds of pages of provisions, probably the most controversial was the individual mandate, which required most people to obtain health insurance either through their employer, through a government program, or private insurance companies. Those who did not comply had to pay a penalty to the Internal Revenue Service, the tax fellas. The critical issue was whether Congress had the power to pass the individual mandate. Let me step back for a minute. Constitutional law is really an extended conversation about the structure of government, the allocation of power between the federal governments and the states, between the legislatures and the courts. Neither the states nor the feds can unduly interfere with the other. Neither the legislatures or the courts can unduly interfere with the other. So let me do some basic structural stuff. There are four primary sources in the Constitution of congressional power to pass statutes. The power to regulate interstate commerce, the power to lay and collect taxes, and the power to spend money for the common defense and general welfare. Those are all in Article I. The fourth source of authority is in the Reconstruction Amendments, Amendments 14 and 15, and they have to do with congressional authority to enforce the civil rights laws. We don't need to talk about that today. So we do need to talk about the Commerce Clause, the Tax Clause, and the Spending Power. The Elastic Clause, the so-called Necessary and Proper Clause at the tail end of Article I, is meant to bootstrap all four of those powers, those in Article I and those in Amendments 14 and 15. The Commerce Power is the most widely used and most important power that Congress has. It was probably the major impetus for passing, for calling the Constitutional Convention in the first place. Many states, under the Articles of Confederation, were operating as independent countries. They had tariffs and import duties and other barriers to goods coming in from other states. Not surprisingly, the economy was faltering. And so the purpose of the Commerce Clause was to promote a national market and curb the balkanization of the new American economy. The first interpretation of the Commerce Clause was very broad and expansive. In 1824, in a case called Gibbons versus Ogden, Chief Justice John Marshall who was himself a framer of the Constitution, that becomes important later, held that the commerce power was plenary, complete. Commerce is intercourse and the rules for carrying on that intercourse. Congress could exercise the commerce power to the utmost extent. And there the law sat until 1895, when the Supreme Court said that the commerce power did not extend to passing federal antitrust laws. That case, the 1895 case, ushered in an era of confusing and often restrictive interpretations of the Commerce Clause, which relied on such formalistic and opaque distinctions as activity versus inactivity, commerce versus manufacturing, the stream of commerce versus the flow of commerce, <laughs> direct effects on commerce, indirect effects on commerce, substantial effects on commerce, 
and unsubstantial effects on commerce. Those tests, not surprisingly, coupled with the Lochnerian hostility to regulation, resulted in virtually unfettered corporate power. This is the golden age and the robber barons, folks. That was why when Congress turned to the Commerce Clause to regulate the conditions that caused the Depression, the Supreme Court rejected the first New Deal. What caused the Supreme Court to change its mind is the subject of much scholarly debate. And we're going to spend three classes on it in my Iliad class in the fall, if you want to know more than you ever thought you wanted to know about that. Suffice it to say, however, that since 1937, the court has nearly always upheld legislation against challenges to congressional authority to pass laws under the Commerce Clause. Perhaps the broadest reading of the Commerce Clause came in 1942 in a case called Wickard versus Filburn. That case upheld the Agricultural Adjustment Act, a law aimed at stabilizing agriculture prices, which were falling precipitously. The statute set quotas for the amount of wheat individual farmers could grow. Mr. Filburn exceeded his quota. The court upheld the law over his objections that the extra wheat was grown in his own backyard and intended solely for the use of his family. The court said Congress could regulate even an entirely local intrastate market because it had a substantial effect on interstate commerce. For more than 50 years after Wickard, the court upheld every exercise of the commerce power that came before it, including the use of the commerce power to enact civil rights laws, to enact consumer protection laws, to enact environmental protection laws. That line of cases ended abruptly in 1995 in a case called United States versus Lopez, where the court struck down a federal law banning the possession of guns within 1,000 feet of a school. The court said the law did not regulate economic activity. It regulated schools. I thought guns, but never mind. <laughs> Five years later, in United States versus Morrison, the court reached a similar conclusion with respect to the Violence Against Women Act. Conservatives heralded the so-called new federalism as a victory for President Reagan and his Attorney General Edwin Meese, who, as you saw in the video, led the effort to limit the power of the federal government. But the celebration was premature, as the court soon returned to the broad approach. In 2005, in a case called Gonzalez versus Raich, the court denied the claim of Angel Raich, a California woman who was growing marijuana for her own medical use as allowed by California law. The court held, joined by Justice Scalia, that Congress had the sole authority to regulate the national market for legal and illegal drugs, even if those drugs were locally grown and limited to local use. Wheat, marijuana. That brings us to health care and the individual mandate. Critics of the law said health insurance is not economic activity. And even if it is, it does not substantially affect interstate commerce. Moreover, the mandate regulated inactivity, not activity. Remember all those words? We all laughed when they used those words. Defenders of the law said, look, everybody's a participant in the enormous health care market, whether one buys insurance or waits to pay medical expenses as they are incurred. Chief Justice Roberts began his opinion with the Commerce Clause and concluded that the individual mandate was not a valid exercise of the commerce power. After a lengthy essay extolling the virtues of limited government, 
He said, the commerce power presupposes the existence of a commercial activity to be regulated. The mandate fails because it forces individuals who do nothing to become active in commerce by buying a product. Activity versus inactivity. Think about that for a minute. I come to a red light. I step on the brake. Is that activity or is it inactivity? The inactivity is not running the red light. The activity is stepping on the brake. This is how we're going to decide what Congress has the authority to legislate? This is silly. It doesn't work. So I will leave for another day, now that you've given me the opportunity to tell my one little story, the resurrection of this essentially silly and unworkable distinction. Many of the criticisms, many of the most cogent criticisms, have been leveled by highly respected conservative legal scholars led by Charles Freed of the Harvard Law School who was Solicitor General in the Reagan administration. I want now to make only two small points. First, it seems to me that even if the Chief Justice's strangely limited definition of commerce had some constitutional support, in the abstract, in particular, it made no sense <coughs> to apply it to the Affordable Care Act. The vast majority of those covered by the individual mandate are presently or soon will be engaged in the economic activity of receiving health care and paying for it one way or another. So clearly for them, the mandate is a regulation of economic activity. Second, let me quote the Chief Justice's words about the framers. Everybody invokes the framers. It'd be interesting if we knew what the framers really thought. <laughs> Nobody took notes except for Madison. So there's a book. It's called Madison's Notes. But there are a lot of other framers there. We don't know what they thought, but the Supreme Court invokes them all the time. Here's the Chief Justice on the framers. To an economist, perhaps, there is no difference between activity and inactivity. Both have measurable economic effects on commerce. But the distinction between doing something and doing nothing would not have been lost on the framers, who were practical statesmen, not metaphysical philosophers. This passage seems to me to be the ultimate in metaphysical abstraction. <laughs> the court has never been loath to rely on economic theories in deciding cases, including Commerce Clause cases. Most interesting is this. Perhaps anticipating this, a professor at Harvard Law School did some research on mandates and discovered that in 1790, the very first Congress, which had as members 20 framers, passed a law requiring, or should I say mandating, that ship owners buy medical insurance for their crew. <laughs> Similar mandates were enacted again in 1792, 1795, and 1798. It's worth noting that because the press has noted this, that none of the other justices signed on to the part of the Roberts opinion dealing with the Commerce Clause. So technically, that's what lawyers call dicta and not holdings. Dicta is random thoughts. They're not supposed to count for precedent. Holding is the real McCoy. But that labeling totally misses the point. Five justices, the Chief Justice and Justices Scalia Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito have now signed on to an analysis of the Commerce Clause long deemed beyond the constitutional pale. Those five justices are ready, willing, and probably eager to place real substantive limits on the scope of the commerce power. Many of the achievements of the New Deal and the Great Society were enacted under the Commerce Clause and are thus in significant danger. 
civil rights laws, environmental protection laws, labor laws, consumer protection laws are now, at least in theory, of dubious constitutionality. Let me spend a few minutes on the remainder of the health care opinion. The Chief Justice was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and his conclusion that even though the Affordable Care Act did not use the word tax, the penalty imposed on those who did not comply with the mandate could be construed as a tax. This seems to me a fairly unremarkable conclusion. Labels have never been decisive in constitutional law. Using what he called a functional approach, I guess to distinguish the metaphysical stuff from before, Robert said, people must either have health insurance or pay a tax. The tax is collected by the IRS and is a small percentage of income or a flat rate. Therefore, it's a tax. Seems right to me. Since 1937, not one federal tax has been declared unconstitutional, including Social Security, which was also enacted under the tax power. Here's what I suspect. Had health care not been upheld under the tax power, the future of Social Security would have been in grave doubt. The last part of the opinion dealt with congressional power to expand Medicaid under the spending clause. Medicaid currently gives federal dollars to the states to assist the poor and needy. The Affordable Care Act expands the scope of Medicaid, increases the number of people each state must cover, and increases the federal funding commensurately. But if a state fails to comply with the new coverage requirements, it may lose not only the new funding, but may forfeit all of its federal Medicaid dollars. The Chief Justice, joined by the four liberals, upheld the Medicaid expansion under the Spending Clause, but said because it threatened states with the loss of their existing Medicaid funding, the full penalties were unconstitutional. Instead, they limited the penalties to the new financing. States are therefore free to opt out, of Medicaid or the Medicaid expansion, and several have already threatened to do so, thus undercutting one of the main purposes of the Affordable Care Act and leaving many Americans without health insurance. This is a disturbing development. It's the first time since the 1930s that the court has struck down an exercise of Congress's spending power. Up until a few weeks ago, Congress was free to impose conditions on the programs it funded under a play or pay theory. In other words, when Congress gave money to the states with strings attached, the strings were almost always upheld if the strings had a real relation to the program being funded. For example, it was just fine to require states to raise the drinking age to 21 in exchange for receiving federal highway dollars. But now there are some new rules. If these strings are so coercive, whatever that means, as to interfere with the sovereignty of the states, whatever that means, there is a constitutional violation. Like the new, constitu like the new rules under the Commerce Clause, this has enormous potential to curb federal power. Many civil rights laws condition the receipt of federal funds on a state's agreement to abide by non-discrimination rules. I'm sure all of you, like me, are staying up late every night watching the Olympics. Many of the women athletes competing in the Olympics have benefited enormously by Title IX. Title IX is now one of those spending clause laws whose constitutionality is in doubt after the health care opinion. Many were taken in by the health care opinion praising the Chief Justice's noble and statesmanlike, not my words, leadership. Don't be fooled. Obama won the battle. Roberts won the war. 
Let me just take another minute to talk about where we're going next. The conservatives on the court have radically rewritten the constitutional law of campaign finance, the law of congressional legislative authority, and the law of state sovereignty. In so doing, they have reincarnated long discredited doctrines that limit the authority of the regulatory state and leave corporate powers virtually unchecked. As in the Lochner era, the majority of the Supreme Court today seems less concerned with social justice than with the protection of the economically powerful, with erecting a shield around business that cannot be pierced by economic and social legislation, and with restraining the government by any means necessary. Even though the Affordable Care Act was in large part upheld, the health care opinions are a significant narrowing of government power. They have created a fundamental shift in the relationship between government and the individual, between the federal government and the states, and paved the way for the return of the Lochnerian ideal. The chasm between the constitutional ideals of equality and egalitarianism and the court's determination to return to the libertarian Horatio Alger mythology yawns wider every day. And it now appears that the philosophical divisiveness plaguing the court has become personal. The press and the blogs are full of stories about the deep personal animosity that the four conservative dissenters in the health care cases now hold for what they characterize as a betrayal by Chief Justice Roberts. Whether this is true or not, the muttering, the background noise, does not bode well for the court's ability to resolve the pressing issues of the day. Other troubles are also looming. This court has virtually ignored the legislature and vastly expanded its own power over the democratic process. In so doing, it consistently second guesses the legislature where debates about public policy are supposed to take place. So what the court has really done is to foreclose future public debate, all the while wrapping itself in the mantle of constitutional imperative. The court's opinions seem more and more to be ideologically driven and intellectually inconsistent. They ignore the real world in which most of us live. They use the language of judicial minimalism and modesty while radically restructuring the social order. As a result, the court is beginning to forfeit the public support and respect, which is the ultimate foundation of judicial legitimacy. If the public has no faith in the independence of judiciary, there is no faith in the integrity of the Supreme Court's opinions. Next year, the Supreme Court turns its attention to race, a subject which Linda Greenhouse has written is the real project of the Roberts Court. The court has agreed to hear a case about the admissions policies of the University of Texas and that case is widely predicted to eliminate the few remaining vestiges of affirmative action. They've also agreed to hear a series of cases about whether Congress was correct to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act of 1965 on the rather remarkable theory that the court thinks it's no longer necessary. The what I call the what do you need it for theory of judicial review. I await those decisions with much trepidation. One final thought. This is a sharply divided court. It has five justices who, in the name of freedom, are looking backwards to a fantasy of an unregulated paradise, which never existed beyond the imagination of the justices who decided Lochner. It has four justices who, in the name of equality, embrace the complexities and economic realities of the modern world. These competing visions cannot constitutionally coexist. Which one will prevail is the most important issue in today's presidential politics. Thank you. So, as usual,
with such rich presentations, we have at least several weeks of Q&A. So if your questions have not made it to the floor, uh, it wasn't because they weren't good questions, but that we do have a time limit that we're working under. Let's start, and this is for both Judy and Gus, um, just picking off <clears throat> from the Citizens United discussion with Judy, but going back to uh, some of Gus's themes, the central underlying issue of much of what's been happening is the corrupting influence of money. So we're increasingly uh, realizing <clears throat> that the politicians, elected members of Congress, really are dependent on money to fund their re-election campaigns, with estimates of representatives spending 30 to 70 percent of their time raising dollars rather than deliberating on policy. The question is, how can this problem be most effectively resolved, and more specifically with regard to Citizens United, it's a regulation that obviously uh, fuels this fire, and the question is, is a constitutional amendment the only solution to that specific fuel? Judy and Gus? Is this working? Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my talk, I think the people who worry about this the most in a professional way have come to uh, the conclusion that uh, a constitutional amendment is highly desirable, and there's a, several major efforts underway to begin that process moving. A um, certain amount of dispute about what it actually ought to say. Uh, but, um, you know, the other approach which people have gravitated towards uh, is reform, uh, you know, reform campaign finance legislation, uh, which would create this uh, combination of small donor financing uh, matched uh, by governmental financing. And the model uh, is, has been successful in a number of, of states. Uh, it has a lot of support in the Congress, but as I mentioned, they're almost all Democrats. Uh, but um, it, it could gather a real head of steam uh, come November and after, after that. Uh, there is a caveat I would put on this, though, and that is that um, this new approach to, uh, to uh, campaign finance reform, which, which, as I said, involves empowering the many rather than trying to restrict the few, uh, has, uh, has some problems in the following uh, facts. Uh, it, it, it depends a lot, once these state laws have come into effect, for example, who takes advantage of the public financing? Are the progressives really ready uh, to move out and to field candidates and to take advantage? Uh, because I'll tell you, one state that has public uh, financing uh, and you know, has one of these fair election laws on the books uh, and, and has a, uh, maybe half or more of the legislators now elected by this process, Arizona. So, uh, and <clears throat> my partner knows a lot about Arizona. <laughs> um, I think the Supreme Court is messianic on campaign finance, on this money is speech stuff, and so I'm not sure that they won't start tossing some of these state laws. That was very troubling to me reading that Arizona case that I talked about, that even a partial public financing with an indirect effect was unconstitutional. Another troubling thing to me, I guess I'm the voice of doom here today, but another, another troubling thing to me today is I've been reading a lot by the leaders of the press who are opposed to a constitutional amendment on the theory that any tinkering with the First Amendment might interfere with press freedoms. And as you know, the constitutional amendments take a long time. They're very expensive. They take years to get enacted. It, it seems to me that one of the ways to go is some of the things that Gus was talking about before. Go to the states in which corporations are incorporated and try and change those state laws 
regulating corporate behavior is a condition for us incorporating you here in Delaware, we require this kind of disclosure, this kind of information. That again is a long, hard process going state by state, but at least you're tinkering with the corporate laws and not the campaign finance laws, which seems to raise a huge red flag to the Supreme Court these days. There were um, several questions that grouped uh, for Gus around uh, the various movements, uh, Tea Party, of course, Occupy Wall Street, um, and the effectiveness of these movements, and to what extent uh, is it possible that they will gather in power and begin to influence what many are as really disturbed over. And an extreme form of this, uh, some people have believed that really uh, we're talking about uh, more of a revolutionary uh, need and um, in order to really make a uh, change that is going to be very difficult to come about. Gus. Well, I think the, um, the Tea Party shows that you can move from protest to movement to power in very short order in America. And, um, and I think that's something that progressives should endeavor to do. Uh, the Occupy community is somewhat divided because I think some would see that uh, as a possibility and they organized this uh, 99 spring and other things this, uh, recently. Uh, but a big segment of the Occupy uh, protest are, um, are disdainful of uh, trying to move into politics anytime soon and are really want to change people's minds and values. Uh, so I think that's both, both directions need to be pursued. I'm a big supporter of Occupy. I think that if you look at Occupy and the Tar Sands protest and the protest in the Madison and other things going on in the country, we may be seeing the beginning uh, of, a, of a major movement of protest. I, I hope that it will, um, uh, that it will uh, escalate uh, after the election. I think nonviolent civil disobedience uh, should be a major part of that. I was arrested in Washington with my good friend Bill McKibben. We spent two nights in the central cell block of the D.C. jail uh, and uh, uh, were in, in great spirits, I must say. Had a, uh, <laughs> I was asked to give a lecture, which I did, and, I, and, uh, and the, um, so it, it was, uh, but I, th I think it's going to take that uh, to really move this country. Uh, we've got to make the space possible for uh, the next president who, you know, I hope is Obama or whomever is there when that uh, Justice Kennedy, for example, uh, steps down and uh, You've got to make the space available to appoint somebody who's going to undo a lot of this damage uh, that Judy so eloquently uh, described for us. In the end, uh, if I have uh, an inspiration uh, for this country, it's Egypt. It's Tahrir Square. I think it's going to take that level of protest and, and, uh, and demonstration to, uh, I'm not suggesting bring down the government in the way that they did, but but we need that kind of outpouring of sentiment uh, that to fuel a, uh, a series of major changes, starting with this pro-democracy political reform uh, of the type I discussed. Um, for Judy, what are the prospects for changing the ideological bent of the Supreme Court? None. <laughs> I guess replacing some retiring justices. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Justice Ginsburg is the oldest, and she has pancreatic cancer. She's not well. Uh, next in line of age, I'm going to screw it up a little, are Scalia and Kennedy. Uh, Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, uh, Justice Breyer is in his 70s. Sotomayor, Kagan, Alito, and Roberts are in their late 50s. So, we'll see. Uh, justice Kennedy loves being the swing justice. It just, 
he's not going to retire, folks. He's not going to retire. And if he does retire, I don't know the prospects of Obama getting an openly progressive judge approved by this United States Senate. Uh, Kagan was sort of a stealth candidate. She was very clever, very clever. She wrote articles about the most boring technical stuff in the world. No one knew where she was coming from, other than she was incredibly smart. And look at the trouble she had. So we'll have to see. But will any of the... This court is so divided, and they're so rigid in their division, I don't see any change happening without a change in personnel. Um, somewhat related, not directly, but someone has asked if the divide of the Supreme Court, whether there's any kind of thing can be read with regard to the gender lines of the court, as well as the religious backgrounds of the justices. Justice Scalia is a muscular Catholic. His son is an ordained priest and the justice goes to mass every day. And he has written things that say, I'm going to butcher the quote, but uh, we are a Judeo-Christian society whose institutions presuppose a belief in a supreme being. Justice Roberts' wife is the head of Catholic Women Against Abortion or some word like that. So there are openly, passionately religious people on the court, and by religious I mean bringing more religion into public life. The court's religious jurisprudence has changed dramatically over the past 15 years or so, and religion, there's no longer a wall of separation as we all learn between church and state. The wall has crumbled. I used to think that gender made a huge difference. Let me just tell you two stories, one that says it does and one that says it doesn't. There was a case a couple of years ago which involved a strip search of a 14-year-old high school girl uh, for illegal drugs in a very small town somewhere. And so after the case was argued, and I don't know how this stuff came out because it's not supposed to, but this came out. After the case was argued, when the judges were discussing the case, Justice Breyer apparently said, well, 14-year-olds, you know, we like to strut our stuff. We like to walk around the locker room naked. What's the big deal? And Justice Ginsburg said, 14-year-old boys are different from 14-year-old girls who grow up in sheltered, small communities. And they changed their mind and said that the strip search did, in fact, go too far. I wrote a little bunch of papers on Justice O'Connor over the years. Justice O'Connor was not really a big supporter of maternity leave. She was not really a big supporter of choice. She was a moderate. She, dis she, she didn't want to have grand style theories about things. She wanted to, she was a true judicial conservative in the non-political sense of that world. To decide the case as narrowly as possible. So I concluded after years of scratching my head about it that the fact she was a woman, other than serving as an incredible role model for women, that her jurisprudence would not, was not markedly affected by her gender. Her jurisprudence was markedly affected by her cancer struggles. She wrote very compassionate opinions about pain and health care. But the fact that she was a woman I don't think had a very large role to play in how she decided cases. And Judy, people have uh, asked about the appropriateness of Justice Scalia uh, to talk uh, quite candidly on Fox and publicly, and I guess that's based on the book that he is marketing. Is, is this appropriate? There's a judicial code of ethics. It applies to everybody except for the judges of the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> okay, for Gus. Um, a few questions about uh, educating people. Uh, some specific, for example, should business schools be playing a leadership role in educating future corporate leaders and giving them a, quote, new set of values. Uh, and will this 
uh, have any effect? How would our education system have to change to bring about the necessary changes that you've talked about? And finally, can you really see any way of changing the attitudes of our dumbed-down citizenry, which has been giving such a mediocre education and expectations of instant gratification that they just don't care about the destruction of the planet? Gus. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the uh, question about the uh, B schools, uh, I, th I think the answer is yes. Uh, we need a lot of change in their in their teaching and their orientation and uh, and what they prize and value and uh, and and teach others to prize and value. I think there's some of that change going on uh, now, and uh, so I think it. But in the end, um, you know, I, I guess I'm in a way that's a, another way of asking. Uh, you know, can we count on corporations to uh, and their schools to change enough on their own uh, through exercise of good sense and good judgment and responsible care, et cetera, uh, to really address these issues? And I think the answer is no. Uh, these people will behave, you know, in the, like good corporate citizens when they're required by the law and incentive structure that's created for them to do so. And uh, there's a wonderful... Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't go as far as I went in my lecture, but there's a new book by a man named Pavan Sukdev, uh, who comes out of the banking community and uh, has written a, this really excellent game plan for uh, what you might think of as early stage corporate reform, but he's, he's not counting on uh, sort of corporate social responsibility ethics to, to, to carry the day. Um, I've been in, fortunate to have been in educational systems where I see young people highly motivated uh, on these issues. I, I was dean at Environment School at Yale and now at the Vermont Law School. And, you know, there are lots and lots of young people that really want to dig in uh, to the, these issues and to take a more, you know, uh, to, to look for the new thing uh, to do and, uh, and with themselves. And, and I, I think the one thing I didn't talk about was this new economy movement uh, that we're beginning to give birth to in the country. And there are articles about the new economy movement in, in the press and uh, uh, new groups being created like the New Economics Institute uh, in Boston and others. And, you know, the idea is to really pursue this notion that we need an economy uh, that, it, that where the real priorities are people, place, and planet and not the ones that we have today. And, and that needs a new economics, and it needs a lot of other changes. But I, in my experience, the young people are really grabbing onto these issues. Uh, uh, and um, I, I see a lot of that, fortunately. Um, and, uh, the, but the educational system has a hard time catching up in, uh, with these, these interests and, this, and the new economy themes that I talk about in, in my book, for example. Um, I mean, when I left um, the uh, Yale Environment School, we had uh, created uh, 130 courses in environmental uh, studies at the, at the advanced levels of masters and PhDs. But um, even with all that expansion and the extra courses and, and the extra faculty that we were able to bring in over a 10-year period, we had barely, barely sketched the surface of digging deeply, you know, having courses that addressed uh, issues like the law of consumerism and how should that be changed, or how do, how do we build these new uh, corporate forms uh, that I talked about, and how to how how can the law affect the gradual uh, shift in in values and, and cultural orientation? Uh, so you know, we were, and environmental law is still very conventional as air pollution, water pollution, and things like that by and large. And, uh, and these new areas where we need to attend really need to be brought into environmental law and into environmental studies in a big new way. I'm just stepping back uh, to treat that a little more broadly, Gus. Uh, people have asked, uh, realistically, who? Who is likely to bring about some of these changes that you've talked about, have the power to do that, 
Um, and is there perhaps hope, as you suggest, uh, in the younger generation of taking the leadership uh, of bringing about some of the change and more specifically with regard to lobbying reform, uh, who would coordinate this action and how long would it take, in your estimation, to be implemented? Well, I think we see lots of different communities that are uh, gathering around the Occupy theme. I mean, Occupy, you know, is not at Zuccotti Square anymore, but it's all over the place. So the people are taking on many, many different issues in the country and different constituencies are coming forward. You know, there's so much suffering in, in, in uh, our country today. I mean, poverty is back up to an all-time high. Inequality is uh, back to 1928 levels. Uh, you know, we lost 42,000 manufacturing plants. Uh, the whole uh, two-thirds of the middle class is vulnerable to falling out of the middle class, according to a number of studies. Uh, you know, uh, and, and on and on. Uh, and I think these groups... Uh, are being, uh, there are organizations, which I discuss in my book, that are helping to mobilize these concerns into effective action. Uh, you have groups like uh, Rebuild the Dream and uh, the American Dream Movement that uh, Van Jones has been central in, and there are other positive things going on to try to build the strength. Uh, you know, check out the uh, 99 Spring, the, the 50 organizations or so in the country that came together to to do that. So I think there's real hope in this movement building thing. I think young people will be heavily involved in it. The, the people that are suffering will be heavily involved. And the question I have is, are you going to be heavily involved? Or are we all going to go back to our nice little New Hampshire and Vermont uh, hideaways and uh, grow our vegetables and uh, come to sessions like this? Is there a way for our generation uh, to really take a leading role in pursuing these themes and, and getting, you know, for, as a first step, uh, organizing this country to, you know, enact these pro-democracy political reforms. Because if we can't save our political system, you know, nothing else good is going to happen. And okay. Um. Yes, we just maybe got time for one last question. Um, Judy, to what degree do you, uh, Judy Brown, uh, combine the Supreme Court's decision for the George W. Bush over Al Gore and the Citizens United decision as causes for the loss of the prestige and trustworthiness of the Supreme Court? Are there other Supreme Court decisions that have similarly made a major contribution to the same outcome? Very much so. I mean, the beginning of this, or the, the beginning to the public of this new judicial activism began with Bush versus Gore. And as I said about Citizens United, Bush versus Gore is bad for what it held, but it's worse for how they got there. The rule always was that state supreme courts have the final word on the meaning of their own constitution. The Florida Supreme Court said the Florida Constitution required a recount. I'm simplifying. And the United States Supreme Court, first after Justice Scalia granting a stay, which stopped the recount, eventually concluded that the Constitution made them overrule the Florida Supreme Court, and by then it was too late because Justice Scalia has granted a stay. So again, it's how they did it. Total disrespect for the way the law had always been construed. And they said in Bush versus Gore, this case can never be used again. It's a one-shot deal. Well, if you're really excited about what you did, you should be making precedent for the ages, not just making a one-shot deal. So again, it's not so much what they are doing, it's how they are doing it. Next year, same-sex marriage, voting rights, probably more 
challenges to congressional authority pursuant to the health care stuff and affirmative action. The whole is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. I think Roberts, Roberts telegraphs his moves. In 2007, he said, I want to get rid of affirmative action, but he didn't have the votes. In 2010, he said, it's time to get rid of voting rights, but we don't, these are cases, and I'm obviously paraphrasing, but we don't have the votes. He's got the votes now, so I think the, whatever checks there are um, will have disappeared. Bush versus Gore began the process. We haven't seen the end yet. Uh, our thanks to Judy, to Gus, and to Townsend. One final video. I know I shouldn't do this, but it was too good to miss on the subject of the Supreme Court. We have assembled the four remaining liberals on the Supreme Court, and they have formed this fantastic singing group. <laughs> You've heard of the Supremes, right? <laughs> this is not them. <laughs> Please welcome the disco stylings of Justices Ginsburg, Souter, Stevens, and Breyer. <laughs> Well, for eight years you've seen the liberals cry, begging us not to die. So we're old. Got no friends. Our legal briefs are now the pay. Are we all right? Are we ill? Didn't give boys seats to fill. With the court, five to four. Death was something we'd ignore. Keep the court from swaying, even atheists are praying that we're keeping us alive. Keep us alive. Another right to justice, if really would disgust us, gotta keep us alive. Keep us alive. Ah, ah. Oi, keep us alive. Hey, does anyone remember when they signed the Magna Carta? 1215. Now, but it's one o'clock. I missed it by 45 minutes. Of folks who couldn't replace me, there's a mob. Caroline Kennedy wants my job. I won't step down for some young thing. I'll work as long as Larry King. I'm all right. I feel great with my pumpkin-sized prostate. Oh. The greet I now would be nuts. They can kiss our wrinkled butts. Since Barack's arrival, no one cares for our survival, so we're staying alive, staying alive. We're moving like a tortoise, it might be rigor mortis, but we're staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 shoot! We have to keep working our retirement funds broke. <laughs>